We've heard so much about the effects of COVID-19 on folks actually younger than the original demographic the government gave us. And in the last two weeks, we've learned of Nick Cordero, a very famous and popular Broadway actor of passing at age of 41 after a 13 week battle with COVID-19. Originally, it led to him losing his leg due to COVID-19. And we have a doctor here to explain why amputations are being seen more and more with COVID-19. Find out why, coming up next. I'm Eric Mitchell, and this is To The Point. With COVID-19 re-emerging, well, I don't think it ever went away. We're, 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 I think we just overreacted and wanted to get back, and I think we're still figuring it all out. But when it originally kicked off, it's now re-emerged. And we're seeing that the age number, the bracket we used to think that was the really target audience of this, we'll use marketing terms to describe it as a pandemic, but we were told it was a much older crowd. Now we're seeing people in their 30s and 40s and teenagers and children's and dogs, children's, that's a good, good Eric, children's is what we're coming with, and children coming down with COVID-19. Recently, Broadway lost an amazing superstar in Nick Cordero. Nick, after a 13-week fight with COVID-19, not only gave up his leg, but ended up losing his life in his fight against COVID-19. Today, we have Dr. Shaw joining us to explain why amputations are on the rise with COVID-19. So let's welcome to The Point, Dr. Shaw. Life Flip Media, the voice of the warrior class. Are you a veteran or patriotic business owner, author, musician, public speaker, or entrepreneur? Are you ready to take the next step towards success? Then look no further than Life Flip Media, the voice of the warrior class. Life Flip Media is the number one veteran-owned PR firm in America. We use our mission-oriented approach to secure advertising and media exposure for your business, your brand, and your products. It's time to let Life Flip Media put you on the cutting edge of success. Life Flip Media, the voice of the warrior class. And welcome to the show, Dr. Shaw. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Eric. Thanks for having me again on the show. Uh, I'm glad to have you back. Uh, I wish we weren't talking about COVID-19 and we were just having a chit chat, but unfortunately COVID-19 is still very much uh, on the forefront of everything we're hearing about. Uh, and I know you have a lot of insight on amputations and COVID-19 and we're seeing a rise uh, in cases where folks, why they battle COVID-19 and they're younger, they're losing extremities or being amputated. And most recently, Broadway star Nick Cordero, who we unfortunately passed on, he had a 13-week fight. But what really brought media's attention is part of during his fight, he actually lost his left leg. What is going on with COVID-19 and amputations? Yeah, no, I think what happened uh, with Nick is obviously... A tragedy of epic proportion, you know, and my heart goes out for, for you know, his entire family, um, you know, who have to deal with this. Um, and it, it does bring up a lot of uh, valid points uh, worth uh, discussing. Some of this, in my opinion, media has really missed the boat on. So, uh, you know, again, I wasn't the attending physician in this case, uh, so I can't uh, comment on the specific details and look like there was a valiant effort made. But there are really two major issues, I think. You know, one is COVID-19 and uh, and peripheral vascular disease. You know, causing these blood clots and and issues that COVID is causing by itself, as well as the treatment of COVID can also lead to that. But a second, bigger, major issue that that I feel like no one's talking about is is amputation. You know, I haven't seen anyone in media bringing up uh, the dire consequence 
of amputation that millions of Americans still uh, go through every every day. Uh, so, you know, with COVID uh, specifically, COVID is a hypercoagulable disorder and it has caused um, issues with uh, with amputation uh, by causing blood clots, uh, which COVID causes in the arteries uh, and as well as in the veins in the lower extremities, as well as some of uh, the treatment uh, that very severe patient of COVID requires a device called ECMO, which can perfuse the lungs, but this is a big bulky device and it can also lead to pressure on the leg arteries and eventually can lead to lack of blood flow causing uh, causing the amputation. But to me, the more important issue is, you know, we're talking about this uh, amputation at a micro level, but I think at a microscopic level, there are millions of uh, individuals in the United States still this state uh, living with amputation and amputation itself is a bad news uh, in terms of it causes tremendous impact on patients' livelihood, their longevity in terms of how long they can live as well as the quality of their life. And it's a burden on them, their families and, and the society in general. And uh, you know, people who have amputation, their risk of uh, survival is as bad as stage four cancer and no one even talks about it. So I think these are the two really major issues that should be brought to forefront. And I wish major organization like Amputee Coalition uh, and media in general would have taken the opportunity to raise awareness um, for millions of individuals in the United States who have peripheral arterial disease and have amputation and, and deal with this. That, that's crazy. I didn't realize that the survival rate of an amputee is that of stage four. I mean, I know several folks uh, in the service that have been either involved in helicopter crashes overseas or hit by IEDs in combat, and they are amputees. And, you know, I'll, I'll give them that. I have a good friend of mine. She attempted to climb Mount Everest. She made it to Hillary's step with missing her left leg above the wow. knee. And she could have kept going, but everybody who was with her couldn't. So it's kind of crazy that she did that. But I know it is hard. Uh, the amputation, it costs a lot of money. These, you know, it's amazing how these legs go Oh, together. it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge burden. I mean, the average cost uh, of amputation, once a person gets amputation, is $100,000 per patient per year. Because they, you know, large majority, I mean, you're, you know, the, the example you are giving is obviously phenomenal. And there are people who rise above uh, any occasion and they, you know, they live uh, to show, you know, uh, and I mean, you know, going back to Nick's story, obviously, he, it seems like he fought valiantly with this. And there are examples like this, but but large majority of the folks, the millions of individuals, you know, over 200,000 amputations that people who go through amputation every year, these are diabetics, these are people with high blood pressure, cholesterol, you know, these people have kidney disease, um, and they don't even realize that they have circulation so poor that uh, they could lose their limb. So, you know, again, amputation can happen in a more dramatic, rapid situation like, you know, the the the, the war veterans or, or, you know, helicopter crash. But but that's less than 20 percent of the amputation in the country. Larger than 80 percent of the amputation happen because of this disease progression, which is completely preventable, which is something that could be picked up by patients, by their healthcare providers and by bringing attention because the treatment is phenomenal and you can prevent 80% of the amputation and yet people even in 2020 go through these amputations and you know again as I said more than 50% of them not will not live more than uh, four or five years and those who get amputation their likelihood of getting amputation on the other limb is like astronomically high like almost higher than 10 times uh, than any other individual and you know obviously they, they don't have the quality of life. And right now, as you know, race in America is, is a big issue, right? racial equality. And it baffles me when I see uh, everyone from both aisles, you know, both parties talking about, you know, racial equality and where do we stand. And I don't think these conversations are complete without talking about the racial inequality when it comes to healthcare in general, but especially when it comes down to amputation and diabetes and, and peripheral arterial disease, because if you happen to be African-American or a Latino or any minority, your risk of peripheral arterial disease and diabetes and amputation is way high. And we saw that in COVID, you know, people who were of color, unfortunately, ended up having worse outcomes. So um, I think this is a lot of conversation are tied and this story really brings it up to the forefront. So let me ask you, so you say that this can be prevented. So let's talk about that. How do people do it? Obviously, the IEDs, those are, those are different. You're right. I mean, there's only 
think 24 million veterans in America as it is, so that it narrows it down. But obviously, there are healthcare measures that we people could be taking. Uh, not everybody has COVID nineteen, you know, like Nick. Yeah, but we're seeing a well, rise. But how do people veterans, prevent it? This is the crazy part. More veterans end up losing their limbs, not because of war or any like war-related injury. More veterans. I want to say ten times more veterans end up losing their limbs later on in their lives because of peripheral vascular disease. So even amongst veterans, when we talk about amputation, it happens way more uh, commonly because of these underlying uh, risk factors, which again, as I said, are completely preventable. That, it, it's, it's bananas. So how do they prevent it? Let's just talk about that. Let's talk about prevention of, of yeah, amputation. So how do people do it? How, if you're watching now and you're like, crap, I have a lot of people we know in America have diabetes or if you're worried about getting COVID-19, which it's spreading and depending on who you talk to in what medical capacity, or you ask our friends on social media, which everybody seems to be an expert, not just on COVID-19, but civil rights and the military lately. <laughs> How do we keep people healthy and to stay away from amputation being this, leading them down the road to amputation? Yeah, so as I said, most amputations happen because of peripheral arterial disease, which is lack of blood flow to the legs very easy to pick up by simple testing uh, more often than not just simple physical exam checking people's pulses make sure they have good pulses so just seek attention early detection and screening is name of the game so if most people think that they, they get leg pain because of age i can't tell you how many times people come to us and say oh my legs are hurting because i'm old or i or i have arthritis like 80 percent of the time you know if they're diabetic they do have circulation problem and and it's a it's a problem that people don't think about it because it's not on their mind they, there is not enough awareness about it so most people think oh it's age related it's diabetes causing some nerve problems some arthritis no in reality they have serious peripheral vascular disease so talk about it with your healthcare providers seek attention if you have pain discomfort discoloration if the legs have those blue black spots or or the skin color is changing, or if they have open wound or an ulcer that's not healing. Oftentimes people get a little bit cut in the skin in between the two toes, and that's not been healing for like few weeks or few months. And that's what we call non-healing diabetic foot ulcer. Diabetic foot ulcer or non-healing ulcer is again, a biggest precursor of uh, amputation. Oh. Because these people with diabetes, they, they have uh, critical limb ischemia, which basically is saying lack of blood flow to the leg. So in, in the heart disease world, we all understand heart attack. We all talk about heart attack because, because we, there is awareness about it. Anytime somebody has crushing chest pain, people immediately think they're having a heart attack and they go either to their doctor or the ER and get attention. Same way, people don't think about the legs causing leg attack or a foot attack. But I, I always tell my, my patients and whenever I'm trying to educate the referring, you know, some of our primary care doctors, I tell them that think of a foot attack or a leg attack. You have a complete substrate based on your risk factor like diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure causing uh, you know, this issue. And then you're waiting for a foot attack which will come and will lead to a potentially uh, you know, very dangerous consequence like losing a limb. So get attention, you know, get screened, just ask your healthcare provider, get the pulses checked, the blood pressure test of the leg. Everyone knows about blood pressure test of the arm. There is a very simple way to check leg circulation by taking blood pressure of the leg at different levels. We can check blood pressure at the thigh, at the knee, at the ankle level. And the name for that is called ankle brachial index or ABI. It's a simple, very effective, uh, every insurance covers it. Even if insurance doesn't pay for it, most doctors will do, I mean, we provide free screening for any folks uh, who, who need this ABI. It's, uh, it's a pretty straightforward, easy test, and it will pick up more than 90%, I wanna say 90, Six percent, actually, based on the studies, uh, in terms of sensitivity and specificity to pick up disease. So that's why number one tip, if you ask me, is detect it. Talk to your healthcare provider and get this easy test. Number two, if you have an ulcer or wound that's not been healing, talk about it. See if there are simple, effective endovascular treatment. People think that if you have peripheral arterial disease, fixing it is a huge problem. You need open, you know, you need surgery and cut down. No, those days are gone. Nowadays, we can fix most of these blockages with simple catheter-based treatment that takes less than an hour in most cases. And you can fix these blockages and this problem that has been going on for years and years, you can at least reverse it to a degree. And obviously, number three goes without saying is um, 
risk factor control. You know, if you're a smoker, obviously it's not a good idea. If you are diabetic, make sure you get checked, make sure you are on all the appropriate medications, uh, and obviously exercise, you know, exercise, eat healthy and things like that. So prevention, early detection, and then seek treatment if needed. I love that you say that. So let me ask you a question, because I've been reading some literature here, and it talks about the fact, and this is, I was just thinking of myself when I read this a couple days ago, that a lot of doctors in primary care, they're not exact examine, examining patients' feet as much as they should. A lot of people, I mean, I can't tell you that I've been to a podiatrist, but I can tell you I get a physical at least once a year. And I can tell you, yes, I understand. I learned in the military real fast that our feet are the cornerstone to our life. Trust me, it's why they always tell us to you know, change our socks when we do long hikes. And I understand my feet are the most sensitive part of my body. My family makes fun of me because of this. I swear <laughs> I, I end up on the ground if I stub my toe, but you can hit me anywhere else and I'm fine. But my toe, I'm done. Uh, I'm on the ground. Yeah. Uh, but why do you think so many doctors, I mean, how do we go? Do we just ask our doctor to examine our feet? I have a physical coming up. I, I'm curious because I want to know because I'm this foot attack. You're the first person to bring that to my attention. And it's concerning because our feet are probably for most of us, our primary way of getting around. Absolutely. I always say legs are the windows to the heart. And unfortunately, there is lack of awareness even, even among some of our colleagues, you know, physician colleagues and healthcare providers in general also. Um, so, you know, we always say that rate of feet exam in, in the uh, office, most doctor's office is less than 5%. So it's, it's an unfortunate, it's a sad reality, I think. Uh, all the you know peripheral vascular disease societies are trying to raise awareness that everyone's feet should be examined, especially if you're diabetic. Uh, in each doctor's visit, not only by examining, I mean, you take the shoes and socks off and feel the pulses, feel the temperature, see if there is swelling, edema, discoloration, all that stuff. It takes less than five minutes, really, you know, to to do the the thorough exam, and you can potentially prevent uh, you know major issue. You know, le legs are actually second heart. Most people don't realize your cow muscles, your calves are actually like a second heart because it's what we call the calf pump, right? Heart is a pump. Job of the heart is to pump blood that goes from the heart to rest of the body. When the blood has to come back, the leg muscles have to push the blood back. So if you go back in the literature and look at the ancient Greek, uh, you know, who, who were the first um, in medicine, they, they call calf as the second heart because, uh, you know, that what pushes blood back to the heart. So legs are so vital to our heart health, our overall health, uh, that it should be paid attention. So I think if you are a patient or a person and going to your doctor's visit, and if you have risk factor, 100% you're gonna mention that I wanna make sure that you check for my circulation, check my pulses are okay or not, and if they're not, get tested. Awesome, so let me, let, let's talk about this. A lot of people, we're, we're talking about PAD or peripheral arterial disease, but a, lot, a big misconception that I've been reading is that it only impacts the elderly. And we hear this a lot even with COVID-19, but we've recently heard from the experts, including the CDC and the WHO, that actually the age group is much younger for COVID. Is that the same for PAD or peripheral arterial disease? I learned a new word today, and I'm using it in a sentence just to be like you, Doc. I just want to... I want to be like yeah, Dr. No, it, is, it is getting it is getting more and more common, right? I mean, a lot of this literature, a lot of these statistics come from like older data, older trials. Uh, and, you know, back in the day, people would not, even, if you were in your 40s and 50s, you would not even get tested because the misconception is, oh, PAD only happens in old people. So there's no need to, uh, no need to check for it. But in reality, we are seeing, and you know, the lifestyles have changed, the stress level in younger people in their 40s and 50s has gone tremendously high. So we are seeing all the risk factors much earlier. People in, you know, we are seeing high blood pressure much earlier. We are seeing high cholesterol much earlier. Uh, so we are seeing all this stuff. So, you know, along with it, we are seeing peripheral arterial disease also very common. The cousin of peripheral arterial disease is peripheral venous disease, which is venous insufficiency, which is way more common. It doesn't necessarily lead to amputation, but it can cause like really bad varicose veins, ulcers, swelling, discomfort, which is also not just a cosmetic issue, it's a major lifestyle issue. And we are seeing that way younger. I'm seeing that in like, uh, in people in their 30s and 40s even. So, you know, these diseases are getting, you know, definitely getting much earlier. Part of it is because now we have easy technology to detect it. So we are finding them faster and easier. Part of it is because our lifestyles have changed. You know, people are, today's like 40 and 50 year old are going through way more stress than, you know, what people used to go way back so you know absolutely and in covid we are seeing obviously that 
yes, if you're older with risk factors, your likelihood of getting disease is way higher and especially the fatality is way higher, but even younger folks like, unfortunately, like Nick sometimes can succumb to this disease and get really rapid decline. Yeah, so, so let, let's go back to that. So we, we talked about Nick and obviously he lost his leg and obviously lost his, ultimately lost his life to this. So I know that there's this going around and, I, and I've read it several places, so I'm gonna ask you about it. Uh, you know, they say PAD is basically, some people believe it's not fatal, but clearly, Nick proved that it is, and I'm not laughing, but it's always, there's always somebody out there that says something's more of a nuisance than fatal, and you're like, and eh, then how are people dying from it? That seems more than a nuisance. Dying is not what I want to happen if there's a way I can prevent it. So how do we change that misconception that people should be looking everywhere, not just the standard? You know, the problem is, and I'm sure you see this, is WebMD is not the ultimate place to go when you have a symptom. It's like when you have a cold and you Google yeah. and you Google it and you find out you should probably lose, you could lose all of your limbs and you're not going to survive and it's the common cold. What should folks do when it comes to taking this serious? I mean, how, I mean, number one, this is fatal, right? If, if you get these symptoms, you could die. Yeah. So again, you know, I mean, um, yeah, I think COVID is, is we are in unprecedented time. You know, I think this is this is a rare time in the history and I hope we can go over this hump, but uh, you know, symptoms have to, be have to be taken very seriously. And we are seeing that COVID is on rise in so many states. Uh, you know, I live in New York um, and I practice in New Jersey. And in these states, uh, you know, finally, after months and months and months, the curve is starting to flatten out. And even now, I, I tell you know my my patients, my you know my friends, family, do not put your guard down, because we don't know when the curve can go back again and when the second wave can come and hit us. Uh, so putting the guard down has never been good, especially in in, in a current circumstance and situation. And uh, you know I think uh, you gotta do this the the safe practice. Uh, seek attention. Nowadays, you know, talking to your doctor is not that uh, that difficult. Apply common sense when it comes to prevention. You know, stay, you know, keep the distance and, you know, uh, and all, you know, like the social distancing measures. I don't even want to go through it because everybody has gone through it. But if you have, if you develop symptoms, don't ignore it. Get tested. Talk to your healthcare provider. Get tested because there is an off chance this could be COVID because people sometimes think, oh, I, I'm young. I won't get COVID. No, that's not true. You could get COVID as a young person. Misconception is like, I didn't, I don't know anybody who had COVID. I didn't like get in touch with anyone you have no clue because right now the spread is, you know, community wide and, and, you know, you could have caught it from somebody who was asymptomatic. So again, always de always go with the possibility that you as a young individual could possibly also have COVID. So first thing is, you know, if you have any symptoms, stay away from others and get tested. And if you have COVID, it's okay. It's not, there's no reason to panic right away. But, but beware of the possibility that this could turn into something fatal very quickly. And, uh, you know, it definitely should not be ignored. It definitely should not be taken lightly. Uh, we are not there yet. Awesome. So let, let me ask you, let me ask you the, this is the elephant in the room with anybody who's in, in the medical field today. Uh, this ongoing debate in our country, uh, I live on the West Coast. I know New York has done a great job with this. Wearing a mask. Uh, it's, it's huge. People fight it but i mean i think i've been one of the first people when i've flown internationally i've worn a mask when i fly just because number one before covid 19 we all honestly if you've looked aboard an aircraft and you thought that we weren't spreading germs to each other sitting like cattle in those airplanes <laughs> you're naive in the first space yeah, uh, but there, but there's a lot of people fighting masks doctor and what's your thought on that obviously you're a medical professional these masks do help and if they keep businesses go open which is key that way we could still go to the doctor, go to the barber, go to the grocery store and not infect each other. And clearly it is spreading. I believe as of this recording, we're at 130,000 Americans alone have died from this disease. Florida is in an all out, like their numbers are tripling daily. Uh, Texas is seeing the same thing. New York and New Jersey, you guys are doing good. Uh, we're doing pretty well here on the West Coast, some cities. I know California has been punished. How imperative is a mask because we hear people oh it, it, it's just mask do help well, right I think a mask a regular mask is not protecting yourself right i think this is a perfect example that how we are all intertwined in this society and our fabric is so interwoven so 
when I wear a mask, I'm protecting you, and I expect the same from you, that you wear a mask to protect me. And together, you and I wearing a mask, we are protecting our businesses, we are protecting our society, because we are we are allowing these businesses to slowly start, you know. And, you know, so I like this phased opening uh, that most governors are doing uh, all across the country, you know. And I think uh, you can debate and argue the timing of it, uh, you know, but... But we do need, you know, businesses to function. We need society to start moving, especially, I mean, in healthcare, because there is a secondary crisis, for example, COVID brought, right, is is those people who had, for like, going back to our original conversation, those people who had peripheral arterial disease and vascular disease and heart problems, they did not seek attention because they were too scared to come to the office. And that has led to its own set of issues of uh, not, not uh, seeking attention early on. So the society sort of has to move on, especially when it comes to healthcare, um, you know, we, we do need like non-COVID care as well. So wearing this mask enables us, uh, you know, by me protecting you and you protecting me. Uh, so I'm all for it. You know, um, you can argue the merits of it, but I don't think there is any data that, that it harms anyone or it hurts anyone. And there is plenty of data that uh, it actually does um, prevent the spread and germs. Now, you know, COVID may change is, uh, you know, some people are saying it is mutated and it's it's less fatal than what it used to be. We don't have enough evidence for any of that. So until we have enough evidence and until the curve is truly flat in, in each state, each region, you know, the guard should not, you know, you should nobody should put their guards down. So I'm all for uh, everyone wearing a mask. I love that you said that because you said something key that I think everybody should hear. And the problem is, is we don't have enough medical professionals on the air saying what you said. It's not helping you it's helping others wearing that mask prevents because we still see it I, I was just talking to this with a guest earlier about the biggest problem we have is how many times i mean since january i mean you're a doc so you obviously tell people to cover their face when they sneeze and you know wash your hands and all these very simple things that yeah. people need to be told now in 2020 which is weird i tell my teenagers hey make sure you wash your hands that's something i've told yeah. them since birth but we're seeing it more and more. And it's good that you brought that up. The mask is to help the masses. And, you know, we have, I mean, obviously you're a guy who goes into surgery. So rocking a mask is part of your uniform of the day when you do it. It's something Absolutely. new for a lot of us to wear one all the time. But you see people, oh, it affects, it's affecting my heart. No, it's not. You're, you're not going to, I don't think any, anybody's going through suffering and you're, I see you laughing. So it makes me feel good that I know I'm right. You guys. No, hundred you know, percent. I mean, we were N95. I mean, during the COVID crisis, I mean, even right now, right. We are, anytime we are doing any procedures. I mean, I, sometimes when people have these leg blockages, you know, we are doing these procedures and depending on the number of, I had a patient, for example, who had COVID and had complete clot of the entire leg had, had just huge thrombus and huge clot. Perfect example. He was young. He was in his 50s. Perfect example that how COVID is causing limb loss, you know, because, he, you know, he had huge blood clot. Luckily, we, you know, he had his truly a foot attack. Luckily, we got him right away. And this is back when, like, hospitals were still figuring out how to deal with COVID patients when they need poor procedures or surgeries. And, uh, you know, we had to make some phone calls and get special permission saying that if we don't operate on this guy right away, he's going to lose his limb and he's going to Cross possibility down the road, lose down the line, lose his life, but right now he's gonna lose his limb. So we we spoke with the hospital administrator. They allowed actually the entire team uh, to do procedure, and this is like I'm talking like March, early March. So nobody knew like, but 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 this hospital administrators had the balls to like basically allow this, and uh, you know so we now this was unprecedented. We had to do this procedure. And some of this like huge clots can take a lot longer than our traditional procedures. So this was like a three to three and a half hour case. And uh, we all wore like N95 mask and not just one because this was so early on, uh, we were all worried about it. So we put an N95, we put a second uh, mask on top of the N95 mask and we put a face shield on top of this. And now you are doing, uh, and then you have a gown like, you know, and then you wear a lead because you're under the x-ray. On top of that, you have another gown. So we have like four four layers, if you may. Um, and, 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 you know, you cannot break scrubs because we all had only one N95 mask. This is when the there was a shortage of PPE. So we were all given only one mask. So you can't really break the, the scrubs during the procedure or anything like that. And we had to deal with it, you know, and we dealt with it. And 
none of the team members in the operating room died. We were, you know, it was difficult to breathe through the three or four layer of mask, but it's okay. You deal with it. And we, not only like we were okay, we 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 were successful in opening this blockage. And you know, the guy saved we saved his limb and potentially his life from this. And uh, you know, these are the tough uh, situations we are in, and we do it. And I mean, you're a veteran, you know, like you know, you know, like if you're in army, you have to be tough. So when I hear people complaining about this, you know, I, I kind of get it. I don't want to make fun of people. I mean, some people truly have underlying respiratory condition, then even a simple mask can make it a little bit difficult for them. But it's not that difficult. And you know, I mean, you don't have to wear it all the time. If you're not surrounded by people and you're more than you're not in a crowded area, you can take it off, you know. So, but if you are in a crowded area, it's 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 very easy to deal with. Yeah, and I, and I think that's one of the biggest issues. And, and then we'll wrap here. But a lot of people, you're seeing rallies and different stuff where social distancing isn't being maintained. Um, people aren't wearing masks because they're under some misconception of the world that their constitution, which by the way, I've read the constitution. There's nothing about masks in it. I, I, I checked. hundred percent positive. It's not covered in the constitution. So wear a mask. Uh, it's funny how people are ignoring and trying to blame, say, two doctors, the one we see on TV all the time, Doctor, the amazing Dr. Fauci and Dr. Drix. Here are two trained professionals telling you to wear a mask. They're wearing masks. You doctors are wearing masks. You're all like, to, it's not like you guys are in a gigantic club going, you know, we're all in on it together. We're telling everyone. No, you're wearing it because you know, you know the hard data. You've been to school. So I think the takeaway is wear a mask. It's tough. You don't, like you said, yeah, you don't I think, have to wear I think everything. what happens is some people are not seeing the dire consequence of um, this deadly disease the way, you know, we in healthcare get to see it yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. And, um, and I think, you know, sometimes if it's not in front of your eyes all the time, you kind of like miss the big picture. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, you know. So I think COVID-19 is real. Masks do protect to a degree. You know, we are still learning more about it. We are gathering more data. So unless we have more evidence, more robust evidence, it's a relatively simple thing to do, yeah. you know, and I think, uh, you know, it allows the society to function, which I think is very important. You know, businesses can open, society can function, which reduces the other healthcare burden and like society burdens. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. We just need, just wear your mask so we can continue doing stuff so you can still go to your doctor's appointments, so you're Let's catching these things, you're, you're getting your, get your hair cut, your nails done, whatever you need to do, go grocery yeah. shopping, uh, I know New Jersey probably doesn't want to hear talk about eating in restaurants, that. but most of us still can do that, except in New Jersey, you guys messed up, wear your mask. Uh, yeah. But I know in New York you can dine in. I know here on the West Coast, a lot of us can still dine in in restaurants. It's wearing masks. It's a pain. Trust me, I have teenagers. And it's one of those things that we have masks in all of our cars now because it was one of those things where you leave and forget. So it's something it takes getting used to. We're all not doctors, so wearing them all the time and being part of our day isn't used to it and we're getting better at it but obviously where I want to thank you Dr. Chow for joining us today this has been an amazing conversation that I think we need to have you back on maybe once a month every couple months to talk about what's going on because number one I never knew that your legs and your feet are the way to the rest of your body and how severe this is that a lot of people don't check and again I'm I'm not kidding when I said no one has ever like hold on let's check your feet when I'm, I'm looking at stuff and I have I'm blessed with or cursed with really large calf muscles. So when you were talking about there's your second heart, I'm like, man, these things cramp up. I'm always flexing and stretching these things. I drive myself nuts. I blame my Peloton for that. But, uh, you know, it's good that you're bringing light to this. And I think so many people need to know. And I think Nick Cordero's passing really woke up people. 41, you know, didn't have, I mean, I haven't looked at his medical records. I'm obviously, and you're not his physician, but I mean, he was in pretty good health, uh, according to everything I read. 13 weeks in the hospital within two weeks he had already lost his leg he never left the hospital 13 weeks he, he passed so uh, this is you brought a lot of good light to people i hope people are taking advice so where can people find out more information uh near you obviously you you're in new jersey so i mean folks can follow your website i mean where should folks connect with you if they want to learn more yeah so uh, once again you know i mean i, I do want to say my my biggest regards to nick and his family obviously it's a, it's it's an epic tragedy uh, I hope uh, you know media and all of us can take some valuable lessons from this uh, in terms of raising awareness. Uh, you know, I hope that uh, we can keep talking about this huge issue. You know, the 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 amputation and peripheral arterial disease, and 
and do not miss the boat on that. Um, uh, we are, I'm available anytime, so thank you for having me on the show. Uh, anyone has any question, you know, can always ask me on our website. Uh, I'm also on all social media, and uh, I'm sure the link will be there somewhere. So please, any questions, feel free to reach out. We'll love to be uh, of any health assistance or, you know, any answers. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Dr. Shaw, for joining us, uh, taking time out of your day to talk with us. It's been, I've learned a lot, if anybody else, I, yeah. I learned something, so I'll, I'll take that to the bank. So thank you again, Dr. Shaw. And we'll be right back with our next guest coming up after. Thank you for watching this episode of To The Point. As always, I'm your host, Eric Mitchell, and we thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, if you know someone that we should be interviewing on our show, or you'd like to be a guest on our show, feel free to email us at hello at tothepointtv.com. We'd love to have you as a guest on our show. Please go ahead and feel free to follow us on Twitter at to the point TV. We'd love to see you on Twitter. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram. We're huge fans of Instagram here at To The Point. So give us a follow at To The Point and a like and a share so you can see the guests that are coming up on IG. And that is at to the point TV. It's not dot com. It's just at to the point TV. So confusing with all these names taken. And uh, also, if you're watching this on YouTube, you know what we're going to get ready to go. But before you do that, if you're a fan of Facebook and you spend a lot of time on there, go give our Facebook page a like and a follow and share it with your friends. And keep in mind, if you can't get to your YouTube, you can always watch us live at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern weekdays. Uh, we appreciate to see you there. And as always, my favorite peeps, you're here on the YouTube and we love you here on YouTube. So make sure that you drop in and you can see every episode and never miss an episode right because if you smash that subscribe button give it a like and flick that bell you know you flick that bell you get notified before everyone else when we drop the latest episode or subscription and as a reminder all of our segments and shows go live weekdays at 9 a.m pacific 12 p.m eastern so you will be the first to catch them and you don't want to miss them go check out our library they are broken down by hashtags so you will never miss an episode. On behalf of our entire team here at To The Point, we want to thank you for tuning in. Because if it wasn't for viewers like you, we wouldn't have a show. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. As always, I'm your host, Eric Mitchell. Be safe. Be strong. Be smart. And God bless America. Get to the point with Eric Mitchell. Mitchell, Mitchell. Yeah. Let's get to the point.